I don't want to preach out of Isaiah today. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I was coming back yesterday from a annual reunion that I have had the last three years with uh, five or six of my other buddies from Dyersburg, Tennessee, some of my best friends as we were growing up. And uh, several of us went all the way from kindergarten through high school together. And we get together uh, once a year and I was coming back about to leave to come back from that and I heard about Tim Shelton. And uh, as I thought about Tim, he's one of the godliest people I know. I mean, he loves the Lord. He is just absolutely one of the most Christ-like people I know. And you wonder, and you all, we all wonder why does God allow something like this? And no one can answer that question. They don't teach that in the seminary. You can't understand the hand of God. At the same time, you trust him through it all. And you don't let it push you away from the Lord. If anything, you make things like this push you to the Lord. And you don't stop praying, but you pray even more. And you understand that as you pray, an anointing comes upon you. Now, you listen to what I'm about to say. This is worth coming to church for right here. When you pray, an anointing comes upon you. And if you don't have it and you try to live life without the anointing of God, it's like running a car without oil. And it's going to lock up and break and you're not going to make it. But when you pray and you have that anointing, you are able to walk through fire and come out on the other side still praising Jesus Christ. We've all seen terrible things happen. We've seen loved ones, terrible things happen to them. And yet we love the Lord Jesus Christ, even when we don't understand. Job said, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Before you ever turn away from God, who are you going to go to? You're going to go to yourself? You know that's a dry well. You're going to go to the intellectuals of our day? They are asking way too many questions and don't have hardly any answers. The greatest intellects out there don't understand everything. Please, don't go to man for all the answers. Go to God. Be a godly person who lives in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And regardless of what you face and go through, you'll make it through if you'll do it in prayer and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's give him praise and thanksgiving right now. Now, sometimes we look at Paul, the Apostle Paul, and think that he was like, from another planet. He was so strong. But did you know that he admitted that he was very weak? I love this side of Paul. You see it a lot in his writings, if you'll just look for it. God used him to write almost a third of the New Testament. And yet, listen to what he says to the Corinthians, probably the most sinful church he ever planted and in the most sin sinful area that he ever planted a church. 1 Corinthians 2, we're talking about marks of godly people today. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech. I wasn't a fancy talker or of wisdom. I didn't try to promote how smart I was, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him 
crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That ought to encourage somebody here today. You say, preacher, sometimes I feel weak. That's because we are weak. Sometimes I'm afraid. All of us experience fear. I even tremble sometimes. All of us know what that's like. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive. I'll give you the West Tennessee word, swanky. Persuasive words of wisdom but rather in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. So that, here it is, here's the bottom line. Your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Let's talk about marks of godly people. First of all, godly people have a humble attitude. Godly people have a humble attitude. Verse 1, and when I came to you, brethren, we'll talk about how he came to Corinth. It was almost accidental. Some people would say, no, it was providential. When I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Now, if you'll read the background of when he came to Corinth, his first visit was in Acts 18. Paul arrived at Corinth. If you read in chapter 17, he had been at Athens. And some people would say that what he did in Athens was a complete failure. He spoke to the Greeks, the intellects of the day. He went to their highest hill, Areopagus. I've been there twice. He told those intellectual elites, they were pagans, but they were intellectual Greeks in Athens, that they had a statue to an unknown God. He said, the unknown God, that the one you don't know, I'm here to proclaim to you and tell you who he is and how you can know him through his son, Jesus Christ, who's been raised from the dead. And when he said, raised from the dead, all, almost all of the Athenians laughed at Paul. The gospel is foolishness to those who are lost, but it is God's wisdom unto us who are saved. Paul led a few people to Christ, and he left Athens and just went to this carnal place called Corinth. Now, if you're from Corinth, Mississippi, don't get mad at me, all right? I was born there, all right? I'm talking about the Corinth, and I'm talking about a pagan place filled with all kinds of immorality, pagan prostitutes who were carrying out ritualistic activity while they were selling their wares. It was all involved in cult worship as they were prostitutes, men and women. I mean, you can't describe the moral depravity of Corinth. Nobody would have thought Paul could have put any church there whatsoever. And yet he goes in there and starts preaching, and a bunch of people got saved. And they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tried to preach in the synagogue. They ran him out. He went and started a church. Paul while he was in Corinth, God spoke to him in a night vision and said, we have it in Acts 18, 9 and 10, do not be afraid any longer. Let's all say that together. Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. How many of you know if God is with you, you're in the majority, amen? I can speak if God is with me. 
though a million men be against me. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. God, nobody had been saved in that city when God said that. God was looking into the future and said, oh, I'm going to save a bunch of people here. I've got many people. For God, it was already done. I've got many people in this city. I believe God still has many people in Memphis that He wants to save, don't you? I believe God has many people in Memphis and in Shelby County and in the Mid-South and in the United States of America and across the world. God still has many people. The reason I know that, Jesus has not come back yet. And until He comes back, we will share the gospel and we will lift high the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is settling down in Corinth. God told him, you stick it out. Don't you be a quitter. You stick it out. A great church. Two of the epistles in our New Testament, two of the longest epistles are 1st and 2nd Corinthians, what he wrote to these people in this church. Oh, thank you, Lord, for this church, the church of Corinth, birth in an ancient pagan city. And notice what he says to him in verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come to you with fancy speech, superiority of speech. I didn't come to you with worldly wisdom. I didn't come to you proclaiming those things. No, I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Paul was a godly man. He walked in humility. He said, I was just a simple guy preaching a simple gospel to sinful people. He walked in humility and he encouraged all of us to do the same. He said to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but all of us know somebody. Oh, they think they're something. Maybe you think you're something. Oh, I'm somebody. You better get real little real quick because God will and can take you down. Walk in humility. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and following, let no man deceive himself. I don't think anybody is more deceived than those people who deceive themselves. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. Did you hear what I just said? The wisdom of this world, apart from Jesus Christ, people who don't believe in Jesus, who think they're so wise, the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God Almighty. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, no, let no one boast in men. Christians, let's walk in humility like Jesus did. Let's don't boast about any accomplishments. If we're going to boast, let's brag about Jesus Christ. Boast about other people, what they do. Boast about Jesus, but never boast about your children. Brag about Jesus. Brag about His church all the time. And that will give you a humble attitude. Godly people have a humbly, humble attitude. Number two, godly people exalt Christ and His cross. People ask me, well, what do you preach about? a bloody cross, and an empty tomb. I've been preaching about that for over 40 years. And if God gives me another 30 years, I'll be preaching about that as long as I live. I believe in the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to save anybody from their sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is not in that grave. I don't believe His bones are in Israel. I believe He rose bodily from the grave victoriously and eternally, and He is alive as I speak. Don't you worry about Jesus. He's alive. He's alive and well. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Even as I speak, Jesus is watching over every one of us right now. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ 
and Him crucified. Wherever Paul went, whenever he opened his mouth, he talked about Jesus. That's why he wore the people out that were unbelievers. They didn't like him. They ran him out of town. We're tired of hearing about Jesus. That's all you talk about. Jesus had radically changed Paul's life. He was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians, have them arrested and have them killed. And as he did, heavens opened. Jesus spoke to him. He was blinded for three days. He goes to Damascus. God sends a man named Ananias there to share the gospel with him, and he gets gloriously saved. Notice what the Bible says about that. Look there on the screen. I know some of you think he got saved on the road. The Bible never says he got saved on the road to Damascus. I know you've heard that all your life. I'm not trying to be the smart one. I'm just saying it's not in the Bible that he got saved on the road to Damascus. It's in the Bible that he got saved three days later when Ananias, a soul winner, went to talk to him. And you say, where did you get that? Out of the Bible. Acts 22, listen to this, verse 12, a certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived, came to me. Paul is giving his own testimony about how he got saved. This is three days later after the Lord had met him on the road. He came to me standing near to me and said, brother Saul, receive your sight. Now they didn't say brother because he was a Christian, they were fellow Jews. Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I looked up at him and said to him, he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. You will be a witness. You're not a witness yet, but you will be a witness, Paul. Ananias didn't know what a witness he would be. Now here it is, verse 16. This is the only verse in the Bible that tells you where Paul got saved. Verse 16, chapter 22, book of Acts. Here it is. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. What's the next phrase? And wash away your sins. Say that with me. And wash away your sins. Paul's sins were still there. He hadn't had his sins washed away. And then wash away your sins, calling on his name. He had not even called on the name of the Lord. And later on, Paul would write to the Romans and say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Paul was thinking about himself when he wrote that. How many of you are a whosoever? Amen. You've called on the name of the Lord and he has saved you. That's the kind of people God uses. People who exalt Jesus and his cross. Paul said, I've been crucified, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. You want to get saved today? You know what it means to get saved? To get crucified with Christ. You let him nail you to the cross every day. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. I die to myself. But Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul preached the saving gospel of a crucified Christ. He said in Galatians 6, 14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross. It's the cross that saves us. It's the blood of Christ that forgives your sins. It's not what you do. It's what Christ did that saves you. And that's what Paul preached. Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ will I boast through which the world has been crucified to me. I don't care about the world. I don't care about the world's stuff. I don't care about the world's money. I don't care about what they talk about. I don't, I've been crucified to the world on the cross. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Oh, he preached the cross, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and following. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. I tell you, these fancy preachers mess up the gospel. It's not a hard gospel to understand. It may be hard to submit to, but it's not hard to explain. Don't try to be so fancy in your preaching that people can't understand you. The simplicity of the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech so that the cross of Christ would be made void, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. 
But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set apart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the world, the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Say that with me. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's foolishness. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul knew that when you get saved, you die to yourself and you live for Christ and you take up His cross. And who told you to take up your cross daily? It was Jesus, Luke 9, 23. And when he was saying to them all, then He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, He must deny himself. You can't live for yourself and live for Jesus. Deny himself and take up his cross daily. Every day you got to take up that cross and say, God, nail me again to the cross. I die afresh. It's not you getting saved again, but I acknowledge that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. Every day take up his cross and follow Christ. Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. You got to die to your own dreams. You got to die to your own desires. You got to die to your own aspirations. It's not what you want out of life. It's what God wants to do through you. And God may have total, totally different idea what He wants your life to look like than you know. God may have a total different plan for you than you've ever even thought about. And I'm telling you, you need to desire that more than you desire anything else. Do you live for yourself or do you live for the Savior? You live for either yourself or for Jesus. There's only two options. Who are you living for? Who do you wake up wanting to please, yourself or Jesus? Make up your mind. Get on one side or the other. The time has come. Godly people exalt Christ and His cross. Thirdly, godly people must admit their weaknesses. Now, verse 3 is one of the most powerful verses Paul ever wrote. I was with you in power and in confidence and in absolute assurance. Is that what it says? No. I was with you in weakness. How many of you ever been weak? Anybody out there been weak? I was with you in fear. How many of you ever been afraid? Anybody? I was with you in much trembling. Have you ever trembled before? Anybody out there? I have. Weakness, asthenia. I've told you a hundred times, I have my asthenia gravis, my muscular asthenia weakness, gravis, grave or severe. I have a physical weakness, and I've had it for 21 years. And he's saying here, I was with you in asthenia. The Bible says the woman is the asthenia vessel. It doesn't mean inferior. It just means the asthenia, the more delicate vessel in a marriage. I was with you. Sometimes asthenia is called in sickness. Paul had some sort of sickness with his eyes. The Bible talks about his eyesight being bad. I was with you in weakness. I was with you in fear. Phobos, phobia. That's the Greek word. We get the English word phobia from it. Panic, fear, aversion of something, aversion of someone. I was with you in fear. I was with you in phobos, asthenia, phobos. And then I was with you in traumas, trembling. That's where we get the word trauma. That's where we get the word shock, distress, trembling, quaking, quivering. How would you like a person like that to be your pastor? Well, guess what? Every pastor is like that. 
He walks with God. And every human being is like that. Every one of us. We think we're so big and strong. You can lift weights all you want to, but you can't take on life by yourself. You can have all the money you want to have. You can't take on life by yourself. Life is too hard. Oh, you may have as many degrees as a thermometer, all right? You may be the smartest one in Memphis, but you can't take on life. Life will crush you down if you don't have Jesus. Only the ones that have Jesus can go through the kind of things that we have to go through in this life. I was with you. Oh, I was with you. I wasn't showing how strong I was. I was with you in weakness. I was vulnerable. I was with you in fear. I was with you in much trembling. People think Paul was just some kind of rock. Paul was not the rock. Jesus is the rock. Paul was on the rock laying down face flat. He would went instead. He didn't have a John Wayne attitude. He admitted his weaknesses. He depended on Christ. Paul knew that only Christ could save someone. Only Christ could heal someone. Only Christ could set someone free from a demonic stronghold. Paul embraced his weakness. Why? So that Christ's power could be manifest through him. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that God had given him, he said, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, Paul right before that said, I'd gone to the third heaven. I'd, I'd seen God on the throne. I can't even talk about what I saw in this vision. You and I have not been to the third heaven. Because the surpassing greatness of these revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Lord, I don't like this. Take it away. No. Lord, I don't like this. Take it away. No. Take it away. No. Three times. And he said to me, my grace is enough for you. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in asthenia, in weakness. Power, dunamis, is perfected in imperfection and weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I boast about my weaknesses. That's what he did in our verse so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When I am weak, he is strong. Therefore, I'm well content with weakness. I'm content with insults. I'm content with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that'll, that'll give you some encouragement, won't it? Some of you came in here today, you were weak. It's been a hard time. And you say, what am I going to do? You're going to trust in Christ. That's what you're going to do. And when you don't understand, you're going to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. If you want to serve Jesus, exalt him and admit your weaknesses. Never brag about yourself. Never brag about what you own and how big you are and how strong you are and how good you look. You just wait 40 years or 50 years to pass by on that last one. <laughs> you may be looking good now. <laughs> wait till 50 more years gets a hold of you, all right? Yeah. Then we'll see. <laughs> Don't go around admiring your own strengths. Godly people <clears throat> admit their weakness. Let's all say this together. I am weak. But Jesus is strong. Praise His holy name. Let's give Him praise right now. Give Him praise right now. Amen. Hallelujah. I got two more points. Y'all better pray. Godly people are empowered by God. Godly people are empowered by God. Verse 4, and my message 
and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. Where has the power gone in the churches? Where is the power that we see in the book of Acts? Don't give me this stuff about, well, that was a different day, Pastor. That's a cop out. Has God changed? He is immutable. He doesn't change. God's still the same God. Maybe we're not going after God as hard as some of those people did in the book of Acts. Maybe we don't pray as much. Maybe we don't trust as much. Maybe we don't lean on the Lord as much. Paul was empowered, not with persuasive, fancy words of wisdom. He wasn't worried about being a PhD in elocution. He just wanted to preach a simple gospel that was powerful to simple people. And he let the chips fall where they may. Totally dependent upon God. Totally empowered by God. How was he empowered? First of all, he had the power of the Holy Spirit. Write that down. The power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts 1-8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. I'm telling you, the power within you of the Holy Spirit is enough to give you all the power that you need to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit will empower you to read and understand this book, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Holy Spirit will empower you to live like Jesus, a Christ-like life. The Holy Spirit will give you the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit will give you spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom and knowledge beyond other people and beyond yourself. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will empower you. You will have power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses, my martyrs is what it means. That's the word martyrs. In Judea, that's where they were. Jerusalem, that's where they were. Judea, Samaria, even the remotest part of the earth. I'll give you power through the Holy Spirit. I'm all for education. But if that's all you've got, you've got nothing. You need the Holy Spirit and His power. And you need the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. When you share the gospel with somebody, there's power that comes out of your mouth when you speak the gospel of Jesus. When you say to them, Jesus Christ loves you. You are a sinner. You have broken the laws of God, and you deserve to be punished. But Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place, and Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. And you now need to turn to Jesus Christ. He was buried, but God raised him from the dead. And if you will repent of your sins and put all of your faith in Jesus Christ and trust in him and call upon his name, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is more wisdom in that than any and all books in all of the world. Oh, we need the simple gospel and the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. Are you letting Him flow out of you like rivers of living water? Are you releasing the Holy Spirit out of you? The Holy Spirit filling is not you receiving more of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't give you a little bit now and a little bit later. That's not how God works. God gave you the Holy Spirit. You were baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, and you received the Holy Spirit when you were saved, and He fills you from rivers of water flowing out of you all the time. Are you experiencing that? Do you know what that's like? It can take you through fire, friend. Filling of the Holy Spirit, you get it, and the gospel of Jesus Christ 
is just as powerful as the Holy Spirit. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, if you want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's when you're being empowered by God. I shared the gospel just the other day. We were at Pickwick Lake, and one of our deacons let us use a house over there. And I went with five of my best friends from high school. They're all saved now. They love the Lord. No drinking. No cussing. Everybody loves Jesus. And uh, we're all getting a little bit older, but we still like each other, all right? And we, we just uh, enjoy each other. But while we were there, we had rented a boat, and we were taking it back and took it in there. And boy, just as plain as, plain as day, the Lord laid it on my heart to witness to the guy that was renting us the boat. So I went up to him, and I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, if you're going to witness, let's just get to it, amen? I mean, there's no sense in dilly-daddling around. I mean, you know. And we talked to each other, and he finally said, yes, I know the Lord, and thank you for asking. I'm not trying to set myself up on a pedestal. I'm just trying to say we all need to witness. What what good does it do for me to get up here and preach to all of you and never talk to somebody one-on-one about Jesus? Well, you can talk to one-on-one about Jesus too. Just ask them, do they know the Lord? And then just share the gospel. And you say, I don't know the gospel. Then you're not saved. How'd you get saved if you don't know the gospel? Sure, you know the gospel. Just tell them what he's done for you. Tell them how good he is to you. How many of you know that God is good to us? Amen. Just brag on Jesus. Leave behind a trail everywhere you go that smells like Jesus, that looks like Jesus, that would just be a Christ-like trail behind you everywhere you go. Don't leave behind turmoil and anger and fear. Leave behind Jesus. Oh, they're empowered by God. One more thing, godly people seek God's glory. Very quickly, look at verse 5. So that your faith, I did all these things so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul didn't want anybody in Corinth or anywhere else to give him glory. He wanted all the glory to go to Jesus. I was praying one day. The Lord laid on my heart. I, I was saying, Lord, I, I give you glory. And I thought about that. Now, you know, I wonder why God said, let no man glory before me. I'll tell you. As clear as, just in my mind, I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was louder than that. I just sensed the Lord say, my glory, you couldn't handle my glory. My glory, Steve, would burn you up. But you can give me glory, and I will use you as my son. I don't want his glory. I want him to have all the glory. I don't care if people forget my name one week after I die. It is not about me. It's about Jesus Christ. I don't, look, it, I'm not here for the glory of Bellevue. Now, does that make, make some of you mad? Can't help it. I'm not here to lift high Bellevue. I'm not here to lift high Southern Baptist. I'm not here to lift high your name or my name. I think all of us ought to agree that we've got one name that we want to lift high, and that is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Seek God's glory, 1 Corinthians 1, 29 and following, so that no man may boast before God, but by His doing you're in Christ Jesus. It's by His doing that you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you're going to boast, brag about Jesus, Galatians 6, 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Bellevue, don't boast about a pastor. Don't boast about deacons. Don't boast about teachers. Don't boast about givers. Don't boast about soul winners. Don't boast about 
disciple makers. Don't boast about singers and musicians. Don't boast about the size of the building or the size of the sanctuary or the amount of the offerings or the number of baptisms or the number of church members or how many we had attend in worship today. If you want to boast, I'll tell you who to boast about. Boast about the one who left heaven and came to earth. Boast about the one who was born of a virgin. Boast about the one who was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. Boast about the one who carried the cross to Mount Calvary. Boast about the one who let them nail his hands to the cross. Boast about the one who died and said, it is finished paid in full. Boast about the one who let them put him in a grave and boast about the one who came out of that grave and boast about the one who ascended to heaven and boast about the one who's preparing heaven for us right now and boast about the Lord Jesus Christ who is praying for you right now and boast about the one who's coming back at any moment. Boast about Jesus. Brag about Jesus. Talk about Jesus and quit talking about yourself. Amen. 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 <laughs> Woo is right. I don't know who you are, but come on over, man. Amen. Seek God's glory. It is not about you. It's not about me. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. But Jesus Christ is Lord. Through every situation, through every trial, even when bad things happen to good, godly people, seek God's glory. You want to be a godly person? Have a humble attitude. Quit strutting around. Junior Hill said, some people are so proud they can strut sitting down. Quit strutting. Nail yourself humbly to a cross. Exalt Jesus and his cross. If it wasn't for a cross, I'd go to hell and you would too. And then admit that you're weak. Nothing wrong with that. That's when you're strong is when you admit that you're weak. It's when you're strong that you... When you think you're strong, that's when you're weak. But when you know you're weak, that's when you're strong. Be empowered by the Spirit of God in the gospel. And above everything else I've said, seek God's glory. I don't want that much glory. I don't want to want that much glory. I don't want the glory. I can't handle the glory. It would burn me up. I don't want it. Well, I don't like what's happened with Tim Shelton and his precious wife and their five children. But I can tell you what, Tim Shelton is a godly man. And everything I just said, he's lived it. He has a humble attitude. He exalts Christ in the cross. He admits his weaknesses. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit in the gospel. And Tim Shelton seeks the glory of God. So, what about you? Do you? <laughs>